Are you pro or anti SEC expansion? If so, which teams would you like to add? So I don't think the SEC needs to expand. I think SEC has plenty of brand value, plenty of monetary value based on the teams they have. There's not a more stacked conference out there. Even at 16 teams, you feel good. But if you want to get competitive, if the Big Ten starts adding these teams, if the Big Ten adds a Notre Dame or gets a Florida State, and you have a gun to my head, and you have to add teams to the SEC, I'm getting real picky. I'm getting real picky with the ACC teams I'm selecting. And maybe one Big 12 team. So if I were to go with one Big 12 team, I would add Oklahoma State. I think Oklahoma State is an awesome football program. One of the most underrated football programs in the country. They're top 10 in winning percentage in the 2000s, I believe. Don't quote me on that. It's either the last 10 years or the 2000s. One of the two. Really successful football program under Gundy. Obviously, it makes sense with the OU rivalry, the connections playing Texas, the connections playing a and I would add Oklahoma State to the conference. That's probably a hot take. Not a huge brand. Not a huge monetary value move. If you're adding ACC schools, the two at the top, Clemson and FSU, although you have a feeling that the Big Ten is eyeing those to expand their footprint because that's what they've been doing with their expansion so far, I would take either of those teams. This is probably a hot take. I would take Miami as well. I think there's enough brand value there to add a lot to the conference. Adding more of Florida is always good. Adding another city in Florida is, is good to me. It makes sense. People say North Carolina be a good basketball brand. It'd be a good brand to add. Jordan brand. Maybe North Carolina, but that's kind of like my afterthought. So those are the teams that I would consider adding. It's Oklahoma State, FSU, Clemson, Miami, maybe North Carolina. Maybe. Philip Mixon. The real question is, will A&M move to the Big Ten? Look, if you're going to believe a talk show host in the middle of Oklahoma who has a dialed-in mystery source in Chicago, then hell yeah, I believe it. But unless you're going to listen to people that aren't Jeff Swaim, no, I don't believe it. That would be as if I were or I were dropping these conference major conference realignment rumors. That would be like if I were to drop Texas as I in the Big Ten or some school that's even less relevant to where I'm out of. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Texas State-based program. If I were to say OU is I in the Big Ten, me in this room here, no. There's no steam behind it, guys. I explored it because people were talking about it. It was running rampant. I had a video about it. I don't think so. Not going to happen. Although, if we were to be realigned, that would be the place you'd want to go. But obviously, we're in the. Don't leave the SEC. We're fine. Next question Cool Condor asks Is there a specific guy on each side of the ball you think we as fans should be paying more attention to? Interesting question. Who is underrated that we're not paying attention to? I think we all are aware of the trio of receivers. We're all aware of the quarterback. I'm going to go with a running back. I'm going to go with EJ Smith. I think EJ Smith cracks the rotation. I've seen enough from him to think that he can compete for running back three with Amari Daniels. I think you need a third guy. I don't think A&M has a one guy hand the ball to him. 25, 30 times a game kind of guy as of right now, I think you're going to have three or four guys get handoffs in a given game. And I think EJ Smith can overtake Daniels or just be part of the rotation himself. So EJ Smith, that would be an underrated, underappreciated guy as of right now. I don't know if he's suiting out for spring, but if he is, we're going to see a lot of him in spring. Defensively, this is tough, man. I mean, Dericky Wright's a popular one. I, I think people have explored that one, so I'm going to park that. I won't bring that one up. Dalton Brooks is one that I've talked about a lot. I think we're going to see a lot of Dalton Brooks if he's not starting. I think he's definitely in the rotation. Cassius Howell is a really good one. The defensive end out of Bowling Green who had 10 sacks last year. I think he sees the field a lot. I think he's a guy that will be part of the tools that Mike Elko uses on his third down packages or even more, more than that. Maybe he's a, even a starter or has potential to be up there. Someone who's underappreciated on defense, and maybe this is, I'm just speaking for myself, someone who really doesn't get mentioned enough who I think was this close to being like a breakout guy last year was Shamar Stewart. I think Shamar Stewart was so close so many times last year to making huge plays. He's so explosive for his size. He's almost disruptive. It's it's I know it's weird, but 
he is so close to being that guy. He's one of those man-child freaks who kind of like had a baby face early in his career, who's super athletic and just huge. It, it's He's just like a weird specimen to watch. I think he takes that next step next year, and he's a guy that's been on the team for a couple years now, part of that huge 22 class, one of the, 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 guy, the five stars that actually stuck around. I think Shamar Stewart, underrated, underappreciated. Let's go with Shamar Stewart and EJ Smith. Those are my two guys. Awesome. Good question, Cool Condor. And I don't know if you guys see his profile picture there. Don't zoom in on that. Texas Hill Country. Regarding the spring transfer portal, what positions do you predict we lose players in outside of Jacoby and McCall? And what positions do you think we attack in the portal? Out of Dripping Springs, Texas. Thanks, Texas Hill Country, for submitting that. Defensively, we've talked about Jared Kerr a lot as a candidate on this channel. Now, let's be clear about something. When I talk about these candidates to transfer out, it is purely based on roster makeup. I don't talk to these guys. I don't hear rumblings from these guys directly. I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know how much they love a and I don't know how bought in everybody is. I don't know that. This is purely based on what we've seen before and the talent we think we have coming and how guys are going to develop. So, Caden Proctor, if you guys haven't paid attention, he's a guy that just transferred from Alabama to Iowa, where he's from, huge NIL deal, made bank, cashed it out, and before he even puts a suit, a, a jersey on, he's transferring back to Alabama. I mentioned a couple times in this show previously that I had a feeling that was going to happen, and I thought guys that just transferred to A&M after spring, not before spring like Proctor, which was weird, but after spring, once people saw how the depth chart shook out, once people saw where they were in like the ranks or, or the uh, the hierarchy of talent on the team, I thought people would probably transfer out that just transferred in. But it's hard to predict that. So if I'm going to go with guys that I know a little bit better than the transfers right now, because a lot of that's still really unknown, I have to throw a Jared Kerr out there just because that area is so crowded now. He's kind of a tweener. He's played nickel. He's played safety. I think we have a lot of guys that can play in those positions. But I also think Jared Kerr is the kind of guy that could emerge there and become a dude there. Because I, I actually am in the minority here. I like the flashes I saw of Jared Kerr the last couple of years. I feel like he's a very experienced player now at a and But he might feel the same way. He might feel the same way about himself. And if he doesn't get that playing time, which I totally respect, that's the main respect reason I have for guys transferring is playing time as you're aging. I could see him being a guy offensively this sucks but i could see a running back transfer because the room's crowded i could see an amari daniels i don't know what's going on with Le'Veon moss as far as we know Le'Veon moss is with the team he's practicing he's training we've seen some weird stuff from him on twitter but he hasn't skipped a beat so that was a guy that i had on my watch list for this before but based on what we're hearing, it sounds pretty positive. So I'll go with a running back, but I don't think it's Ruben. I, I, it's either Le'Veon or Amari or an EJ, but EJ just got here. We don't know much about that. I'll go running back, and then I'll go Jared Kerr. But I'm not betting on it. I'm not betting. Again, this is speculation based on talent. But it's going to happen, guys. We're going to have transfers, and it might be someone that we don't expect. So just keep an eye on it. It could be a quarterback, a very good quarterback room at AM right now. Very crowded. Mr. Dixie Isamoris, thoughts on Solomon Washington's offensive emergence as a drive and finish guy on our offense and his ability to lock down opponents on defense. So guys, forgive me. I didn't catch every basketball game this year. I definitely watched them in the tournament and I've definitely watched probably around 10 games this year. What I see from Solomon Washington is extreme athleticism. And when I watched Solomon Washington play, I wonder if he has the skill set to make it at the next level. Because I know he has the athleticism. His leaping ability is absolutely elite. It's insane to watch him contest shots out of nowhere. This guy flies. He just appears out of nowhere and contests. And now he's finishing at the rim. It's huge because we don't know what happened to Coleman this year. His fall off is it's very sad. He's very much been a, a leader for the school. A very good Aggie, if you will. Obviously, Marble missed the year. I don't know much about that. Can somebody shed light on Marble? I'll get with you guys in the chat in just a section. In just a second, I'm, getting, I'm running away with these questions right now. I think it was desperately needed. I'll just put it that way. I think we really needed a, 
a bigger guy and he's bigger based on his athleticism than his actual size. I think we needed a bigger guy to emerge. And I think it's perfect for AM. I I believe he has more eligibility left. I need to see him come back. I need to see him cook for longer. I, I need to see him develop some more skill, but his athleticism's off the charts. Really glad to have him, especially with kind of the dip in, in, in productivity of Coleman and the absence of marble. Let's check in on the chat guys. Tyler Eubanks says, Sankey needs to add FSU and Clemson and see how their rival schools like that. Yeah, they would not like that. Yeah, that would be a power move. Those are seems like them and Notre Dame are kind of the big three that are left out there. The absolute, I think they're all power brands. I think they're all legit as good as it gets out there. If you go for those two, let the Big Ten take Notre Dame. I think it all makes sense. But I have a feeling that the Big Ten's going to try to get into Florida just like they tried to get into Pac-12 country and they did. So I think the Big Ten's going to make a push there. Just like they're allegedly making a push for A&M. That's not happening. Oh, Jeb, you, you asked a question that I answered it already. Five guys who you think transfer out after spring. Okay, let's just expand on that real quick. I'll give you five definitive names. So I already said Moss. I said Daniels. I'm not saying they're going to transfer out. Those are candidates. It's, it's, it's four guys that could be productive in the room. Maybe it happens. That would hurt because you need more running backs. So that's two there. Let's just say Marcel Reed, quarter, quarterback room is very crowded. He does, he is on the right trajectory where he can come into his like collegiate prime after Connor's gone, maybe after Henderson's gone. I don't know what happens there because Miles O'Neill is really good. So you could see a quarterback transfer and that wouldn't be too surprising and it wouldn't kill us. Jared Kerr, I don't think anybody on the D-line is like a, a prime candidate to transfer right now. Shoot. Let's go with an O-lineman maybe, pretty crowded, experienced room there. I don't want to throw a name out there. Maybe an O-lineman. Let's just say an O-lineman. Is that a cop-out? Maybe. Those are five guys. Thanks, Jeb. Thanks. Playoff Spurhorn. Another Longhorn. What record does Elko have to achieve to be successful in year one? I love this question. I love questions that put me into the season because I want to be there already. What record does he have to be successful? So to I say this every year. There's always like a stomachable schedule, a stomachable record, and then there's like a successful record. I don't think I would be able to stomach a seven-win season again. I think I would be sick. I think I would be very nervous heading forward into this Mike Elko venture. If he had eight wins, I absolutely would not be satisfied. I would not feel great. But I could accept it in a year one. We've talked about how much new is going to be on this team, especially on defense, with the coaching message, with the culture. But there's a real good argument that the benefits outweigh the negatives there because of some of the culture stuff we've heard about Jimbo's program in hindsight now. And that's always like shiny object syndrome or recency bias. I'm forgetting the fallacy that is being committed here. But the current thing is always better than the former thing. We always do that. It's why we always say, well, good luck, bye, get out of here to transfers. And like, I want my, three, my hardworking three stars even more. It's that kind of mentality. But we've heard a lot of bad about Jimbo's culture, the work ethic of Jimbo's guys, the clicks. So maybe A&M is good enough to be a 9 or 10 win team this year. And I think successful would be a 9 or 10 win season. Eight is acceptable, but I don't know if I'm like running and calling that a success. You know what I mean? What do you guys think? I'm saying 9 or 10. 9 and 10 are successful year one for Elko. Maroon conquers all. In this next decade, will Aggie football win two championships or three national championships? I think this is a fun question. You're, you're having fun with me here. I mean, if you're ever betting on your team to win three championships in a decade, you're either Nick Saban, Alabama, or you're delusional. It's fun to be a delusional sometimes. Look, I don't know about next decade. I know I'm going to see A&M national championships in my lifetime. There is too much going for this university. There is too much going for this football program, financially, facilities-wise, fan base-wise, student body buy-in and size-wise, the atmosphere of Kyle Field. You have every tool here. I think every other program that has the tools that A&M has is either contending has won recently, or has won in the not-so-distant past. So this question, I mean, I'm not going to take it that seriously. 
I don't think we're going to win two in the next 10 years. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe three. I know I'm going to see a championship before too long.